Um, during the webinar, I would ask if you could keep your um, keep yourselves muted and your cameras off unless you're presenting. Um, uh, it, there will be a question and answer period after the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation you don't, and you're worried about forgetting them, just use our chat box at the bottom. Um, and then we'll look at those all at the end and uh, divert those to the relevant uh, presenter. If you are having technical issues, we're probably not going to be able to help you with those at this point. Um, but please refer back to the re recording that we're going to be making and uh, making available on YouTube as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Irina. Um, I'm just going to let some more people in. Sorry. Um, it all. So Irina is our hydrologist at Carter Conservation. She's been with Carter Conservation since 2003. And before joining us, she worked with the Ministry of Environment and has also been in academia, where she was involved in research and teaching um, and numerous other things. So she leads Koala Conservation's Food Forecasting and Warning Programme and covers many other responsibilities, including a variety of projects related to all aspects of water resources, surface water, precipitation and groundwater monitoring, in also including low water response and climate change. So lots of different areas. I'm really delighted that Irina is going to be presenting for us this evening. So without further ado, Irina, um, please uh, begin your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. So I'm starting my presentation. It's pre-recorded. Uh, I will be saying again, thank you very much. <laughs> and good evening, everybody. So, okay, just give me a second. Good evening. Thank you, Emma, for introductions. I will start our seminar by explaining how the flood emergency management works in Ontario. As multiple agencies are involved in this process, I will explain roles and responsibilities of different partners in this system. Quarsa Conservation is one of 36 conservation authorities in Ontario, which are local watershed management agencies mandated to ensure the conservation restoration, and responsible management of Ontario's water, land, and natural habitats. Conservation authorities provide a variety of programs and services to its member municipalities and the public, including flood forecasting and warning, environmental and natural hazard protection planning, stewardship, and education. On the map all, uh, on your right, the black line outlined the Kwasa conservation jurisdiction. The jurisdiction of Kawarsa Conservation is based on the natural boundaries of the Bolson, Cameron, Sturgeon, Pigeon Lakes, and Lakes Skugok subwatersheds. And it covers parts of six municipalities, what makes them our member municipalities. City of Kawarsa Lakes, Township of Skugok, Township of Brock, Municipality of Clarington, Township of Kavan Monagan, Municipality of Trent Lakes. Since earliest time, people have lived along the edges of rivers and lakes. Rivers have always been a source of drinking water, a flood source, a transportation road, and supplied powers to mills. Later, close to our time, Living at water has provided and continue providing nice reviews and better recreational opportunities. However, living too close to water puts us in danger, as all rivers flood. It is important to remember that floods are natural phenomena that cannot be eliminated completely. A flood happens when channel does not accommodate the amount of water that flows in it. So there is no other way for a river but to spill out of its banks into floodplains. Floods are part of the river life cycle, and floodplain is an area in which river uses periodically to stretch and spread out. 
Floods are the most common and costliest natural disaster in Canada. About 40% of floods occur in April and May, and it includes the Corsa Conservation Watershed, where a majority of floods is a result of spring melt and rain that comes at the same time. What do we do in our watershed affects flooding? For example, cutting forests and clearing bushes increases volume of water that gets into the channel at the same time. So it increases the flood peaks. It also increases velocity of water uh, that flows in, in the channel that in turn increases the risk of flood damages. Changing climate conditions very likely contribute to the high water level events seen in the recent years. The key principle of the emergency management in Ontario and Canada is a partnership. Overall, emergency management is organized as a system of governmental, non-government agencies and individual partners that all have specific emergency management roles and responsibilities. It is all begins at the individual level, moving through the community or municipalities, the province, and then the federal government. As the emergency escalates, higher levels of governments are involved. Public safety begins at home. Each individual is responsible for the safety, preparedness, and well-being of himself, herself, and his or her family members. In the event of a large-scale emergency, entire neighborhoods may temporarily be isolated from local emergency service providers and utilities. Individuals and families should be prepared to be self-sufficient for at least 72 hours. In some cases, neighbors may be called upon to assist each other. By taking a few simple steps, we can become better prepared to face a range of emergencies. Being prepared includes learning the risk around our house, around neighborhood, around our region, preparing a family emergency plan, building our family emergency kit, staying informed, there are plenty of information on these steps available on the internet. Uh, the Canadian Red Cross, your municipal websites, provincial websites, they all include this information. If you need a further assistance on it, please give us a call and we will be happy to help you with When an individual cannot cope with the situation or emergency is, is really serious and lingers for longer, Municipality will step in and help. Please remember that municipalities have the primary responsibility for the welfare of residents and protection of property. They have the authorities to respond to not only flooding and flood emergencies, but all types of emergencies. To provide an efficient response to any emergencies, including flooding, municipalities develop emergency management programs tailored to local, local needs. They plan emergency response in advance and develop partnerships with citizens' organizations and private companies. Municipalities will declare a flood emergency if it required, and they will request provincial assistance if it's needed. In many cases, a response capacity of the municipality will be sufficient to deal with local emergencies. Conservation authorities support local municipalities in flood management by providing flood forecasting and warning. To achieve it, we monitor watershed and weather conditions and assess flood potential on a daily basis. We communicate the flood risk to municipalities and public when it's required. We encourage and support municipal flood emergency planning. Conservation authorities also provide flood-related expertise and technical advice. 
the producer of water has to be undertake a number of steps. First of all, we read water levels in local uh, rivers and lakes. We obtain weather information and weather forecasts, uh, information on precipitation, air temperature, potential for severe uh, thunderstorms, severe weather, and also we analyze uh, watershed conditions such as snow cover, soil moisture, etc. The gathered information is analyzed, a flood potential is assessed, and the next steps are planned. This process is called a daily planning cycle. In our operations, we rely on the data provided by our own monitoring network, as well as partners' networks and data. For example, information on lakes water levels comes from the Transsever waterway monitoring gauges. Uh, weather forecast comes from the Environment Canada uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, some internet sources. There are a number of monitoring locations around and close to the watershed that provide real or near real-time data. That includes five lake gauges, trans waterway, seven stream gauges that are part of uh, Water Survey Canada, seven precipitation gauges, and four snow courses. To communicate the flood risk and inform member municipalities, partners, and the public, we issue flood messages. There are three types of flood messages. Watershed condition statement type indicates a lowest level of flood risk. In general, it informs that water levels are higher than normal, but no flooding is anticipated. We can also use it to provide information on a potential upcoming event when weather forecast indicates conditions for high runoff. When the flood risk escalates, we issue flood watch that notifies that the potential for flooding exists. And lastly, a flood warning is a notice that flooding is imminent or occurring. Flood messages are distributed to our partners and media outlets and posted on the Corsa Conservation website and social media sources. You can also subscribe to receive flood messages in your email box. And this slide clarifies of what the conservation authorities, including Corsa Conservation, do not do. We do not provide any safe or rescue operations. We do not do any sandbagging. We don't do any uh, ice jam clearing, any road maintenance. We simply don't have the resources to do that. Okay, and now about the provincial role. On a provincial level, Emergency Management Ontario is an overarching agency that is responsible for the effective emergency management programs throughout Ontario and for coordination with federal government. A flood, flood hazard, among the other emergencies, is assigned to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So roles of the province include operate and maintain a provincial uh, forecasting and warning system Surface Water Monitoring Center, uh, provide flood forecasting and warning services where conservation authorities do not exist through the uh, ministries, districts, offices. So, for example, Minden uh, Area MNRF Office is responsible for the flood forecasting and warning for the Burnt and Gull River sub-watershed area. Receive information from conservation authorities, Ministry of Natural Resources, district offices, and other agencies, and analyze that information in provincial, uh, province-wide context to guide the MNRF's response to a flood. Lastly, the role of the federal government includes providing assistance to the provincial governments when requested 
and may take the lead during emergencies that clearly impact on the federal jurisdiction. Within the Warsaw Conservation Jurisdiction, there is another very important federal partner, Trans Severn Waterway. The Trans Severn Waterway is a part of the Ontario Waterways that is in turn the vision of Parks Canada. The agency owns, manages, and operates large dams within the Kwarza Conservation Watershed. It also operates numerous other dams that are located throughout the Trent and Seven River uh, watersheds. There are four dams on major lakes in our jurisdiction. It's a, a Rosedale Dam, Fenelon Falls Dam, Occasion Dam, technically two dams actually, and Lindsay Dam. As I already mentioned, they are all part of the trans Waterway system and are operated by the agency. The Burnt and Gull Rivers are headwaters for the system and include also a large number of dams and reservoir lakes operated by the trans Waterway. Actually, the Gull River has uh, with the, there is 20, there are 21 dams within the Gull River subwatershed and 13 dams on Burnt River. Anna Chirab, in her presentation that just coming after mine, will explain the Trans Seven Waterway system, its operations and challenges. And with this. I conclude my presentation on roles and responsibilities of agencies in flood emergency management in Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina, for that. Thanks, Irina, for that presentation. I think that was really, uh, really all encompassing, covered a lot of uh, ideas there and uh, and lots of different information on roles, so that's great. Thank you very much. So just moving on, um, our next presentation is from Anna Shearap from Ontario Waterways. So Anna is a water management manager um, and Ontario Waterways is a division of Parks Canada. And as Irina mentioned, uh, manages the Trent Seven Waterway and Rideau Canal. So I'm hoping Irina can take us to that next presentation. Working on it. Thank you. So I would say again, if you do have any questions throughout any of the presentations, please use the chat box at the bottom um, and then we can gather those together and um, get the presenters to respond at the end of the presentations. Just need another second. Good afternoon. Today, I would like to provide you with a summary of uh, water management structure, um, Trans Seven Waterways, Parks Canada. I'm, my name is Anna Chirap, and I'm uh, currently the water management manager for Ontario Waterways, Trans Seven Waterways, and, and Rideau Canal. Next slide presents uh, the table with the summary of multiple water management goals and objectives that we deal with. Uh, on a daily basis when we make our decisions regarding the uh, operational uh, work across the uh, watershed and across our control structures. Mitigation of flooding is one of the uh, most important priorities for management, especially during the uh, uh, seasons that are prone for high levels and flows, such as freshet or wet summers. Understanding that uh, understanding the negative impacts to public and private infrastructure, full awareness 
uh, of the extent of this kind of impact is one of the daily basis for decision making across the uh, trans sovereign control structures. We manage for water supply and we manage for water quality, a presence of, and uh, presence of agricultural and municipal stakeholders along our, our waterways. Irina, well we've as, lost uh, the presentation. Uh, It's not coming. The presentation is not on screen. We had we had it and then it went and now we've we've completely lost it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I will turn it back a little bit. Understanding that, uh, understanding the negative impact to public and private infrastructure, full awareness uh, of the extent of this kind of impact is one of the daily basis for decision making across the uh, trans sovereign control structures. We manage for water supply and we manage for water quality, a presence of, and uh, presence of agricultural and municipal stakeholders along our, our waterways as well as uh, um, use of the system for water supply uh, is one of our daily objectives. Navigation takes place on a yearly basis and as a result uh, we strive to provide navigation, sustain navigation levels and flows across the season and have a successful end of navigation seasons towards the uh, beginning of fall. We are aware of um, multiple species at risk presence in our systems, invasive species, management for wildlife, wetland and fish habitat. We work jointly with our environmental team on the decision making that we have on a daily basis. We are aware that optimizing the enjoyment of the water throughout the watershed, one of the essential objectives and tasks we have on a daily basis. We also work jointly with multiple water power generation authorities such as Ontario Power Generation, Aurelia Power and others. Recent years uh, in our memories uh, do have examples of very high water level and flow conditions. Very quickly we remember 2013, 2014, 17 and 19 uh, having the years, having the conditions that definitely signify themselves of being above average. Parks Canada manages this kind of conditions uh, with full awareness of public safety. We do understand that it definitely results in high flows that disrupt the navigation and try to mitigate and manage on our best effort basis. High flows impact aquatic habitat, flora and fauna, and standing and managing the system with this kind of objectives is one of the overarching, uh, I guess, points we, we have to have in our uh, decision-making base, in our decision-making processes. At the bottom of the slide, you could see the uh, table or graph, I guess, uh, which represents uh, the impact of climate change or its footprint on the hydrograph or inflow dynamics uh, every year. In blue is the typical hydrograph where you see peak right around April, mid-April towards early May with the recession towards the month of June. As a result of climate change, we are expected to have much more dynamics winter seasons with potential rain and on snow events, as well as much lower peaks during the freshet due to losses of snowpack prior to the freshet arrival. As you could see that freshet peaks uh, do shift to much earlier dates as well. The low flow conditions early in summer is one of the uh, impacts that are forecast as a result of climate change. We 
There have definitely been through the years that signify themselves as very dry years. One of the examples recently likely going to be 2016 and 2020. In the event of dry conditions, public health is not initially endangered. However, water quality takes, takes an impact, negative impact. Navigation can be threatened as lake levels decline. Fish spawn in shallow areas are in danger. Reservoir lakes do drop more than normal and the hydrogeneration doesn't benefit from low flow conditions. Trent Severn a water management team has a very good tool, uh, which are automated gauge network to provide us with the full awareness on a 24 hour basis about our system behavior response, as well as information that is suitable to make the decision moving forward in the next 24 hours as well as future forward uh, uh, kind of uh, conditions. On the left hand side is a map which uh, uh, provides you with the location of all the automated gauges as well as the snow water equivalent gauges which would be the weather station example of them are given on the right hand side in the pictures. We also conduct the manual observations to contribute as well as substantiate measurements that do arrive from the automated weather uh, automated uh, weather station as well as the automated gauge network. The information is available to us on a 24 hour basis, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This information is being pulled via hyperterminal from all the automated gauges across the Trans-7 waterways, summarized in very concise tables and distributed to the associated users of this kind of information. That would be water management team, as well as operational team, as well as the environmental team of Trans-7 waterways. We do share this information with the public stakeholders. This information is being posted on a daily basis on our webpage, as well as shared with the stakeholders such as municipality, conservation authorities, as well as Ministry of Natural Resources. This slide presents you with the current availability of information pertaining to the weather forecast. Environment Canada provides the water managers with regional as well as global forecast uh, outputs that are generated on a daily basis multiple times throughout the day. Likely, the highest certainty is obtained from the next two days of the forecast. High uncertainty is present from on the forecast starting from day three and onwards. For example, we are seeing the uh, summary of 2020 um, or likely 2019 uh, forecasted event as high as 150 millimeters to the left bottom. The figure is presenting uh, an event moving our, uh, through our watershed as high and de depositing as much as 150 millimeters of rain. This is definitely almost twice the amount of monthly precipitation within two days of a span. And as you can see in the table to the right, all that precipitation was not present as of the uh, regional forecast. So this kind of uncertainty is one of the important constraints that is present on a daily basis in air, in our decision making. It's definitely very hard to proactively mitigate any kind of event of any kind of nature, whether it's inclement or not inclement, when this certainty is simply not present past the third day of the forecast. Current conditions on the ground. Environment Canada provides us with a summary of winter months. To the left-hand side, you're seeing the section of Ontario just above the Lake Ontario. Um, uh, with the gray, light gray shaded uh, colors. Those shaded colors are uh, basically associated with the total amount of precipitation from month of December through January and February being at least 25% below the normal totals for those three months. We are also seeing months of March on the right hand side in a very dark shaded uh, gray shaded colors which puts us at at least 75 percent below the normal for the 10 days of march one may conclude that we did not receive the normal amounts of precipitation as a result of the winter uh, we also are going through the period of the months of march where we have not received any 
precipitation only traces, which puts us into much severe deficit of the precipitation on the ground. We also remember the last week event with close to 20 degrees temperatures on the ground. As a result, we definitely have seen changes in the system um, as an impact from this event. On the left hand side, you're seeing the distribution of the snowpack across our watersheds. Darker blues are definitely the, the sections of the watershed towards the north, close to uh, Muskoka and Dorset, north of Halliburton, having basically around 150 millimeters of snow water equivalent, lighter amounts towards the section of Kawartha Lakes, and almost negligible amounts of, of snowpack down uh, through the Trenton area. As a result of uh, last event melt, we've lost most of the uh, snowpack accumulation across the Kawartha Lake Basin, as well as the uh, lower trend section. We still retain the snowpack up in Halliburton's area. Some of that definitely diminished, but yet stayed intact. The slide presents the summary of Kawartha Lake starting from the past summer of 2020 until uh, present time. Average line represents the average uh, full conditions of Kawartha Lakes over the past 40 to 50 years. The blue line represents dynamic uh, fluctuations in the lake levels across all the Kawartha Lakes jointly, again uh, expressing a percentage full. And the red line is the Atonabee River outflows uh, expressed in the cubic meters per second. As you could observe, navigation season is typically determined by a very good stability across the season as uh, water levels are being managed to sustain navigation. Fluctuations in the Kawartha Lake levels jointly are generally driven by amounts of evapotranspiration loss or evaporation from the water surfaces, um, localized inflows contribution, and uh, rain or precipitation events throughout the navigation season. You could also observe the management of the Atanabi River, uh, which is definitely driven by amount of flow or excess of water available from the Kawartha Lakes, as well as which is also determined by the contribution from the Halliburton Reservoirs that are being used to ensure we sustain the navigable levels across the system. The drawdown practices here are depicted to start right around uh, the month of uh, November. From November onwards, you could see in general, on average, as well as the last year, Kawartha Lakes are subject to the drawdown. The decisions uh, of the rate of drawdown are uh, definitely based on the formation of the snowpack, its distribution, its amount, and as a result, forecasted uh, melt uh, water runoff volumes will provide us with a decision making where and how quickly the Kawartha Lakes need to be uh, taken through the drawdown processes. An event of above average temperatures uh, early in the season, as we've experienced it one last week, uh, definitely seen right in this figure as well. You could see that uh, as of last week, on March the 8th, we've experienced very high temperature event, which generated rapid melt runoff into the Kawartha Lakes, bringing their averages quite above the normal for this time of the year. This slide represents the storage of Halliburton reservoirs jointly. Uh, storage is presented in, in percentage, and uh, here 100% represent 100% full. Black line represents the average values of reservoir lakes since 1975. The red line represents the minimum values of Halliburton's reservoirs since 1975, and blue is the current conditions of reservoirs as of 2021. As you could observe, as a result of below, no, below the normal amounts of precipitation and colder than normal February conditions, we've definitely uh, seen Halliburton's levels and flows dropping below the average for this time of the year. In anticipation of a uh, warmer spell in the, ne in the next uh, few days, as early as potentially uh, next Monday or Tuesday, we're going to see above uh, zero temperatures during the day as well as during the nighttime. As a result, we're expecting to experience or walk in into the first initial stages of the freshet. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation um, and uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to provide you with the uh, basic structure of the water management that is taking place in Trent Severn Waterway on a daily basis. Thank you.
Okay, and thank you to Anna for that presentation. Lots of really interesting information about the waterways and how, how that all works. Um, so I just want to move on because we've got a number of presentations to get through this evening. So our next presentation is a joint presentation from the City of Quarle Lakes and Red Cross. So we're delighted to have with us this evening um, Janine Mitchell. So Janine is a manager in the Human Services Department for the City of Quarle Lakes. And Janine has worked in emergency management for the last uh, seven years and has direct experience supporting residents who experienced significant flooding in 2013 and 2018 in both the city of Quarle Lakes and the county of Halliburton. We also have Dave Fraser. So thank you, Dave, for joining us as well. So Dave has been a volunteer with the Canadian Red Cross for 13 years. He joined the Ottawa Emergency Management Team in 2008 and over the years has responded to numerous um, uh, displaced families from their homes by fires, for example. He's also deployed across Canada and the USA for up to 21 days at a time in response to major events like tornadoes, hurricanes, overland flooding and wildfires. In 2020, during the pandemic, he's been supporting the Ottawa Wellness Visits Outreach Programme and checking in with isolated seniors in our community. When not on response, Dave leads an Ottawa communications team that promotes through community engagement, the work of the Red Cross and the value of emergency preparedness. So thank you both Janine and Dave uh, for joining us this evening and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sherry Davidson, Manager of Communications at the City of Kawartha Lakes. Today I'm joined by Janine Mitchell, our Manager of Human Services, and Dave Fraser, a long-standing volunteer with Canadian Red Cross. The purpose of our session is to help guide residents on where to go for important resources and information about flooding in Kawartha Lakes. As we all know, the spring thaw can bring unpredictable weather and areas within the north of the municipality, such as the Burnt River, are prone to flooding. This is why each year it is critical that we refresh our knowledge to prepare and stay informed during this season. With that being said, I'm going to start the conversation by asking Janine to provide us with a brief introduction to human services role and what you'll need to know in the event of an emergency. Janine? Hi, thank you so much for participating with us in this meeting and hopefully we can provide some valuable information and we'll be able to answer any questions at the end of all the presentations. So I'm one of three managers here in human services for the city of Kawartha Lakes and I have seven years experience with the responsibility of participating in with the emergency management committee supporting residents through emergencies like flooding and things like that. Uh, the city of Kawartha Lakes itself is responsible for our emergency management program. And Mark Pankhurst, our fantastic fire chief, is the city's community emergency management coordinator. And so what he would do, he would be bring together key roles and functions for planning purposes of, for emergencies. So that could include the communications department, it would include human services, paramedics, fire, police, and roads. And we all work together to determine the best plan of action to support people during uh, a an emergency and also to help on the flip side of preparing for it and planning for it beforehand. Human services itself, we provide services for both the City of Quarth Lakes and the County of Halliburton, and we have a responsibility to provide information and potential support to residents who are affected by emergencies and disasters. So um, we're kept informed, what's an important part of that is we keep, we're kept informed of any emergencies by the city's communication lead on flooding. So we would receive daily and sometimes hourly updates with detailed information that helps us inform what response is required. The information that we would receive would include the potential areas that will be, potentially will be, or are currently flooded, the severity of that flooding, and the, st um, the status of the conditions. So for example, in, in 2019, we knew we were headed for higher water levels and a higher water flow than in previous years. Then depending on the severity of that situation, so what I mean by that is, is it a localized concern? Is it a smaller area? Or is it an area that historically floods or floods every year? Or maybe it's an area that never floods and now all of a sudden it's flooding. 
Um, is it something that's um, unexpected where we have no notice or um, warning that we're going to be having an emergency? Is it, has it been declared officially an emergency by, by the city of Fourth Lakes or has it been declared officially as a disaster through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing? So that's information that's all used to determine what level of support we're going to be looking at and providing. So we have a, an agreement with Red Cross. I mean, they are the experts in emergency planning and providing direct services. We've had an agreement with them for as long as I've worked for the city and that's been over 20 years now. And we rely on them to support us with providing services and supports and, and information and research and education as well. Support how we determine how much support um, based on a number of factors. It will include information like the number of people who are evacuated. So what is the anticipated number of evacuees and what are the timelines for potential increases in those numbers? And that's all tied with the roads that have been, um, that are flooding and, and the roads that potentially will be flooding. So we need to have information to know how many households are on that road or, or in that area. That's the information we use. The number and extent of the disaster, including what is the current state, what's the predicted state, the expected duration of the evacuation operation. So how long will people be out of their homes is important information for us to have. Then we also have to look at, um, depending on the emergency, if there are any identified threats or hazards to those affected or to our volunteer relief workers. Um, are there any road closures? Are there any stranded households? Information like that we need to look at. Then based on that information, we determine what level of support we, we provide. The first level is basically human services response. So we have calls received to by our office and they are responded to our intake team. And we have a registry that will be kept that will include the name, address, number of people living in the household, some contact information and any brief notes that we might need to know. And we'll keep that information and um, we will contact people if need be through that list. The next level of support is a level one personal disaster assistance support, and that's provided by Red Cross. That's when we would call in Red Cross, and that would look something like a reception center where there would be registry and inquiry services. Generally speaking, it's usually offered when there are fewer than 30 households affected, or if it's affected over a long period of time. And this is normally the first level of service we request. And it's oft, most often it's the only level um, that we need to have. The next level is a level two personal disaster assistance response. And that's something like an evacuation center. And Red Cross would support us with cots, sleeping mats, bedding, comfort kits, food. Generally speaking, this is usually implemented when there are 30 to 50 households or more than 20 households per day, so a lot of people in a short period of time, or something where there's been no planning possible, no, no notice. Generally with flooding in this area, as we know in advance about the flooding and we receive flood warnings. The manager of human services, in this case me, is responsible for contacting Red Cross and activating their services. It's really important to register with Human Services or Red Cross if they have been activated um, and, and uh, register through their reception center directly. We really encourage you all to do this should there be a flood watch for your community. It really helps us to coordinate any service or support that will help inform, uh, and that information will also help inform our emergency personnel of potential people who could be affected by flooding it also helps inform Red Cross of any materials or supports or supplies they might need to um, they might need to be prepared with in order to support people. Um, it's also especially important to let us know if there has been a vulnerable household, meaning that the person may live alone, or they might need to use a wheelchair, they might not have a vehicle, or they might have other concerns that would indicate they would benefit from additional support in the event of a recommended or mandated evacuation. That's really important as well. We also caution everyone on the importance of keeping informed and evacuating when it has been recommended by our emergency personnel. The impact of evacuating before the situation becomes more intense is vital. There is the potential to impact both our personnel capacity and being able to get to people, 
and also the potential for increased safety concerns for both the people, you, living in the household, and also our emergency personnel or Red Cross personnel who are assisting you. In the event of an emergency where your home has flooded, there may be fi financial supports available. It, it just, it depends if you meet eligibility requirements, then you can connect with human services to determine your eligibility for assistance. Um, there are some provincial supports available, but um, they're very specific and can only call the, and they're only activated under very specific circumstances. It's called the Disaster Recovery Assistance for Ontarios, Ontarians, but it's only activated um, when the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has declared that the event is a, a disaster. It's also important and advisable to make arrangements in advance that would include potentially staying with friends or family should your home be in danger of flooding. Uh, Dave Fraser, joining us from Red Cross, will be providing more information about the importance of this and about the importance of having arrangements within 72 hours. If you do need um, temporary accommodation, then you're also able to access a place called home. It's located here in Lindsay and they will be able to assist you. I'm just gonna share a slide now that will provide information of contact information. So you can see there, it's um, you can apply to us for, for assistance. You can apply online at CKL Human Services at coraflates.ca. You can include, in if you're sending an email, you can include the flood emergency request right in the subject line, and that will, that will tag it for our staff to know to, who to send that information to, and include your name, contact information, any a description of your request or any special accommodations that might be there. You can use this email address both to register with us, but also to request financial assistance should you need that. If you don't have access to a computer or email, or you feel more comfortable using the phone, you can also phone us directly. And you, when you hear the voicemail message, just press two and you'll be immediately contact, connected with a live person who will be able to listen to your request. I've also included in there information about a place called home, the temporary shelter, the contact number. Okay, I think that's it for me, Sherry. Thanks so much, Janine, for that information. It's really important to know how you're there to help and how Red Cross is there to help in uh, these really difficult situations when uh, our residents are faced with a flood. So with that, I'm going to pass the conversation over to you, Dave, and hoping you can share just a little bit more about the services that you provide, and if you could touch on how residents uh, can get ready and some of the supplies that they should have on hand in case of a flood. Well, thank you, and uh, hello to, uh, to everyone. Uh, it's a, uh, an absolute pleasure for the Canadian Red Cross to join you today, and uh, I must commend you. Uh, for taking the initiative to be well to be well informed and well prepared for potentially spring flooding that uh, that has occurred in the past and hopefully it does, doesn't happen again this year but uh, you never know and it's always great to be uh, to be prepared. Um, the Red Cross uh, in situations where we're activated by the communities like uh, Kawartha Lakes um, results in our um, up our activating our, our volunteers and our resources in order to, uh, to support um, the community and the, uh, the residents that are there. And that uh, initially, as Janine has indicated, initially starts off with um, a reception center being opened and the Red Cross being asked to provide uh, reception, information, and uh, most importantly, registration. Um, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of registering with the uh, with the Red Cross when you're directed to do that, regardless of whether you're staying with friends or family members or you're going to the reception center. Uh, we need to know who you are, um, where you are, and uh, and just as importantly, how you're being affected by the uh, by the emergency that we're responding to. And once we know that information, then we're in a position to continue to be in contact with you to ensure that your needs are being met all the way from through the relief phase and then well into recovery. Uh, one of the commitments that the Red Cross makes uh, to the communities that are being effective is, affected is that uh, we'll be with you, working with you to provide you with support uh, well through the relief and into recovery until things are pretty much back to normal and hopefully 
in a better position for uh, for the future. Um, second stages when they uh, are initiated, there may be a request for lodging services to uh, to be provided, and when that happens, we activate our um, lodging supplies, bringing in cots and blankets, probably more volunteers. Um, although under the COVID protocols these days, we don't know whether things will be done virtually or whether we'll be on site, but whatever it takes, we'll, uh, we'll be there to, uh, to support the uh, community. And we also have the resources to uh, support other basic needs, such as food delivery, um, clothing, first aid, uh, other personal services as well. Um, so before all that happens, though, um, there is a tremendous opportunity for households to get themselves prepared um, to mitigate um, as much of the impact that could happen both to their homes um, and to their families should a uh, flooding situation uh, develop. And it's a pretty easy process to go through once you kind of understand the, uh, the tenets of it. Um, is three steps. And the first step is to understand what your, the risks are. And so in this situation, um, when we're talking about flooding, you know, questions that you might want to ask yourself are, am I in a floodplain? Is my home in a floodplain? Um, have I been affected by flooding before? Um, has the situation over the winter been such that there's a tremendous amount of snowpack or the ground is going to remain frozen for longer periods of time so that as the snowpack starts to melt or we get a heavy rainfall, that the ground is saturated and there's no place for the water to go then other than to accumulate close to my foundation that could then leak and, um, and flood into, uh, into your basement. So, and then once we understand that there are some risks associated with this, then we need to make sure that we've got a plan in place to mitigate those, uh, the effect of, uh, of those. And that plan is multifunctional and there's some great guidelines on our website to help you kind of go through that. Um, but things that you need to consider is, do I have a good communication plan? Um, communication is key. Communication that allows you to keep in touch with the municipality and the authorities that are going to provide you with information as to what's happening, right? Are we on a flood watch? Are we now moving into flood warning? Is the flooding happening? Um, here's where you need to go if you need to evacuate those, uh, those types of things. And of course, power outage is a possibility under those circumstances. So you need to take that into consideration in your communication plan. Um, do I have available a battery operated radio, for example, that I can keep in touch with the authorities through that? Or is my cell phone going to be charged enough to, uh, to go through those types of, uh, types of things along those lines? And then things like, is my sump pump working? Uh, if I have a sump pump, um, are my eaves troughs cleared? Um, and is the water going to be taken away through the downspouts uh, far enough away from my foundation? Those types of uh, types of things. And then the third tenant is uh, developing a kit um, or supplies that I would need if I was going to be, and here's a great uh, visual of, uh, of some of those things, and I'm gonna show you some of the things that are in my kit here um, as well as we, uh, as we go through that. But um, things that basically would allow you to look after yourselves for 72 hours, um, should I have to, uh, to evacuate? And so um, if there is an evacuation order, sometimes it, the evacuation order happens quickly, right? You need to get out of your home and you may not have time to kind of bring all these things together that you need to take with you. So that pre-planning phase, right, um, being able to collect and have a kit ready to go should you need to evacuate provides you with a peace of mind, right, that allows me to be a little bit calmer and so on and not have to worry if I have to leave my, uh, have to leave my home. So um, kits are available. There's many types of kits that are, uh, that are available. This is, um, this is my kit, right? Uh, the red, that's available through uh, redcross.ca. 
um, to purchase there, but there are many other kits through Costco and Walmart and so on and so forth that provide you with uh, many of the basics that you would need um, if you had to grab something and, uh, and evacuate on the orders of the municipality. So things that would be included in that, a little bit of water, uh, you might want to have some energy bars or non-perishable food. A good first aid kit is uh, is always important to uh, to have. I always like to have a utility knife. It's amazing the types of things you can do with a utility knife. Um, always carry a whistle, right? So that if I get trapped someplace, at least I have a means of giving an indication of uh, where I might uh, might be. Um, and then the most valuable thing in my kit, right, is this um, um, wind-up flashlight, which also serves as a radio as well. Um, very, uh, very, very uh, handy to uh, to have those uh, have those things. So if you looked at those three steps, right, you would have the basics of preparedness and getting ready for potentially the spring flooding that could have happened in uh, in your area, which provides you, as I indicated before, a nice little peace of mind that, you know what, if things happen here, I'm gonna be pretty well prepared to do that. So these three steps you can do right now. And we encourage you to do that. And as I indicated at redcross.ca backslash ready, there is a very nice guideline that helps you walk through all the steps um to uh to do uh that emergency plan for yourself so your plan as well should include steps to take when the municipality issues a flood watch and a flood watch indicates that there is the potential for flooding or flash flooding occurring and that's kind of the trigger for you right to do the final preparation right, of the things that I need to do in order to make sure that my home is as safe as I could possibly get it, and that my family understands what we're going to do if flooding occurs. So what are some of the things you need to think about there? So if you're like me, there's a lot of family heirlooms, photographs, and so on that are in my basement in a storage area. And it's the last thing that I would want to have those affected by flooding. So either finding waterproof containers that you can store these in and raise them up in your basement, or ideally take those things now and move them up onto a second level floor in your, uh, in your home so that they are safe. If you do have a sump pump, making sure that it's working effectively, uh, you may want to have a backup for it, a battery powered backup in case you lose power. Um, Thinking about things like, do I need to rent additional pumps? Um, would it be advent advantageous, depending on where I am, to have a gas-powered um, backup generator that, uh, that I could uh, use? Making sure that generator is outside uh, and not inside. Um, so things like that. And then very simple things that people don't think about, right, are, are my eaves troughs open, can water come down my east trough and am I taking the water away from my foundation in, a, in the case of a rain? Um, I have seen so many people that have, have ended up with water in their basements because water is accumulated around the foundation because they didn't take the water through a heavy rainstorm down the east troughs and out far enough away from the foundation that it wasn't collecting there. Um, so those are um, some of the other things that uh, that you should that you should be thinking about doing when the flood watch warning or flood watch indication comes from the municipality. And then the final thing that I'd like to um, indicate to you is that when you when we end up in a flood warning, which means that the flooding is occurring um, and the potential that your home is going to be impacted by that, there may be um, as Janine has indicated earlier a request to evacuate. And that's a tough decision for most residents, right, who are fighting to save their home. But quite honestly, an order to evacuate is being issued because there are safety concerns for yourself and the community and to the first responders as well. 
um, as Janine has uh, has indicated. So by all means, follow the evacuation orders. Um, when the order for evacuation happens, you're going to have your grab kit that you can take with you for the fundamentals that you need to look after yourself. But generally, you will be directed to a reception center where you want to register with the Red Cross. Um, the other, and then the reception center will provide other services as uh, as well. So regardless of whether you're going to stay with neighbors or stay with friends or whatever, um, it, it's very, very important, again, to emphasize for you to, uh, to do that. So please evacuate if you're asked to do it. Uh, register with the Red Cross and take the initiative right now right, to get your preparation and your plans in place. So again, thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you and certainly will be available uh, for, uh, for any questions afterwards. That's great information you provided, Dave. Can I ask you a follow-up question that we often get from residents? And that is, if we've gone into a flood warning situation and we've been asked to evacuate our properties, are we best to leave our sump pump running and leave our hydro on or what's recommended as far as safety? Um, so my experience is that um, if as part of the evacuation order, many times the uh, municipality will indicate to the resident that they should turn their water, gas and uh, electricity off. Um, my recommendation is that if you are in a position where you can do that, that's the best thing to uh, to do. Certainly the gas um, should uh, should should go off. And the reason that I'm saying and and quite honestly, if, um, with uh, yeah, electricity as well, I mean if if um, if you start to get flood waters rising, um, uh, and it gets into the furnace, uh, you're going to have, you could potentially get electrical um, shorts and then the gas is affected and so on. So my, my recommendation is that they, unless the authorities indicate that you don't have to do that, that it's probably a good thing to do. Thank you very much, Dave. That was uh, excellent information. And you're so right about taking those steps now so that when the warnings start to come out, you're ready, and uh, we really hope that's not the case this year, but we, we hope that residents will take some steps now. One of the things that you mentioned was being dialed in and aware of um, the severity of the situation. And so uh, from the municipality's point of view, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the uh, resources that we have for residents. So uh, the first is anyone that has a computer or a phone, a uh, cell phone, can subscribe to our news alerts by going to our website, to our uh, forward slash subscribe link. And there you can sign up to um, whatever email alerts you would like to get um, from uh, several options to just the very uh, minimal weather and emergency alerts. And then you'll be kept up to date on flooding. Second, if, um, and Dave, you touched on this, when the power goes out or when you have to leave your home and you still want to keep in touch with what's happening in the situation, or if you have uh, family that live in Toronto that are going to help keep you up to date, or if you're a property owner that lives in Toronto and you just want to keep dialed in, our app is an option for you as well. So if you download our app called Ping Street, then you'll have all of the news and updates right on your phone. And if you enable us to send you notifications, then you can get a ping or a notification as the situation advances so that we can draw your attention to um, the escalating situation. So that's two ways to dial in. Uh, the third is follow us on social media and you'll also receive those same updates, whether you're on Twitter, Facebook, or you can follow along on YouTube for any videos or updates from council. And finally, our website, our, our flood page on the website is always up to date with information for residents. So now you'll find um, plan ahead information, um, how to create your kit, how to get your property ready. And in uh, coming days, you'll have information on sandbags, uh, sandbag supplies, if we get to that stage and you want to prepare your property. And 
and uh, we hope we won't have to have evacuation information, but if that's the case, you're already dialed in by all of those options above. And if you've got um, you know, neighbors that you can check in on and share this information, that would be appreciated. If you don't have access to a computer or a cell phone, um, you absolutely can listen to our updates via radio. Our local 91.9 FM uh, is Bob FM Radio, and they keep uh, residents up to date with the information the city puts out, as well as if you dial into uh, Chex Television. Uh, so there's some options to keep informed, and we hope uh, you will. And we, again, thank you, uh, Janine. Thank you, Dave, for all of this information. Really, uh, really good to get a jump on the season. Thank you very much for that presentation. I think there's an awful lot of information in there and some really great advice and tips for people who are maybe concerned about where to start and how to prepare themselves more effectively in the future. So with that, I just want to go to our uh, final presentation. Um, so our next presenter is Cheryl Evans, who is the Director of Home Flood Protection at the Intact Centre on Climate Adaptation at the University of Waterloo. Cheryl has over 20 years of community engagement and programme management experience in the fields of stormwater management, flood risk mitigation, home energy conservation and youth environmental education. She served as a technical committee member on CSA's guideline on basement flood protection and risk reduction and was a lead curriculum developer for the Ontario College's flood risk assessment training programme. So Cheryl holds a BES in the Environment and Resource Studies from the University of Waterloo, and we're delighted that she's with us this evening. So over to you, Cheryl. Thanks, everybody. Good evening. My name is Cheryl Evans. I'm the Director of Home Flood Protection at the Intact Centre on Climate Adaptation. We're based at the University of Waterloo. My presentation is called Get Started Today to Reduce Your Risk of Home Flood Damage. I'll talk a little bit about the growing cost of flooding in Canada, the connection with climate change, and then dive right into some tips for practical actions you can take at your home to reduce risk of flood damage, and some considerations for flood insurance as well. Now, first of all, let's dive right into some home water damage fast facts. Did you know that water surpassed fire as Canada's most common cause of insurance claims over 20 years ago? The insurance industry often says that flood is the new fire. The majority or 60% of water claims are caused by leaking appliances and water pipes, and the remainder are split between sewer backups, sump pump failure, and overland flooding caused by heavy rainfall. All Canadian homes are at risk of flooding for these sources, and only roughly 5% of Canadian homes face additional risk due to overland flooding from rivers, lakes, and oceans. And those risks involve force exerted by moving water on walls and foundations of homes, as well as damage caused by collision of debris in moving water, could be anything from ice or trees, whatever is carried in the moving water, and also property erosion can erode underneath a home or a building and damage the structural integrity of the, the building. In terms of the impacts of flooding, they are big and on the rise, unfortunately. The insurance industry for since about 83 has been recording annual ad average catastrophic insurable losses. So that means they add up any single event that costs $25 million or more, so a catastrophic loss, that is, um, impacts the insurance industry in Canada. So from 1983 to 2008, on average, it could be expected that the insurance industry would pay out $405 million per year for cat losses. And from 2009 to 2018, the trend started to arc upwards. 
And now we sit at about $1.8 billion per year on average for cat losses. Over 50% of those costs are attributed to flooding and the uninsurable losses, so those not covered by insurance, are covered by governments and homeowners and unfortunately those are three to four times that amount. In response to the very large uptake in, um, in costs associated with losses, the insurance premiums for homes have gone up on average 20 to 25% in the last five years. 15% of that increase is, is due to water damages. So this presentation is not just about talking about what some of the challenges are, it's looking at realistically what are some of the opportunities to reduce risk for residents. So there are many things that are essentially with, out of the control of residents, but some things that are within the control, and that's what we'll focus on today. So outside of the, the control of residents are things like increases in extreme rain events and winter melts linked to climate change, aging infrastructure in municipalities that needs to be upgraded, and there's just not enough funds yet uh, to, to make all needed updates, loss of wetlands, forests, meadows, and more paved surfaces due to increased development. And the other piece that we'll talk about today is the lack of household level flood protection. So things like not completing maintenance or equipment breaking or uh, cracks in foundation, etc. Now, when you look at it in the grand scheme, only the household level, so within the property law, within the property boundaries and the home itself, are under the control of residents. So that's what we're going to focus on today. What is under your control to manage? Now, flooding is complicated and it's great to get started on your own, do some self assessments, um, some basic work, but always there is an important consideration for working with, with government uh, agencies, insurance, and with um, local qualified professionals just to help you round out your, your information. And when you and a variety of supports are looking at what you're going to do to reduce your risk, you're going to look at a variety of options and it depends on the type of flooding that you're dealing with, the severity of the risk, and your short and longer term risks. <clears throat> what my program focuses on is the highest level of protection that is um, most commonly needed for everyone in Canada. So that is rainfall and sewer backup related flooding. The approach to managing those risks is called dry flood proofing. So the idea is to defend your home, keep the water off your property and out of your home. And when there is <clears throat> an the anticipation that will be quite a strong event or a significant event, you can also supplement with temporary barriers. Now this can apply to everyone in Canada and can help reduce the risk of impacts. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I just want to note that for properties that are besides beside rivers or coastlines, that other approaches are also important to consider. So wet flood proofing is one of the approaches that can be taken. The idea is that essentially you design a building so that water can go in through the building and back out. It can get wet, but then dry off quickly. Um, of course, temporary barriers are great for those situations as well. You can also elevate the buildings. The most extreme situations um, you would consider relocating the building, either putting it higher up on a parcel of land or removing it altogether. So depending on the extremity of the risk, um, this is uh, a complex decision and uh, it's something that you, a decision that you make with support from professionals after taking some time to consider. So diving right into home flood protection, which is the focus of the work that I do, that is on the, the cons main considerations are around dry flood proofing. So the main principles are to keep water out, remove it quickly if it gets in, 
and reduce risk of damage by selecting flood resistant storage options, furnishings, and building materials just in case it gets in and will do minimal damage. So things to remember about this type of uh, flood risk reduction and all types actually is protecting each home is unique and it's based on the lot level characteristics and of course the influences of community level characteristics. For example, if you're near a river or an ocean. And the other thing to note is action taken to protect homes can reduce but not eliminate risk. So at our center, we created a flood risk assessment protocol and we worked in a variety of communities and with homeowners, we assessed over 510 homes. Now we looked at 80 features at around the home, physical features as well as maintenance practices. And when we boiled down all of our results, it became very clear that the same things were coming up again and again and again at most homes. So what we did is we created a very simple infographic that provided three clear steps that people can take to reduce risk that look at the simple things you do first, then the more complex, and then the more expensive, um, uh, more complex things that you do last. So what we found first of all was critically important is to maintain what you've got at least twice per year. These hopefully are things that you're familiar with already. So remove debris from the nearest storm drain and ditch and culvert, clean out your eaves troughs, check for leaks in plumbing and fixtures, test your sump pump, and clean out your backwater valve. So it's good to do those things in spring and fall, but particularly if a huge rainstorm is coming, you can also do a little extra check to make sure everything's fine. Second of all, you can very easily go to the hardware store and get some simple materials and complete some simple upgrades. Uh, one, if the fire, fire department permits it, you can put on some window well covers to keep the water out of your window wells and out of your basement. And it, you can extend your downspouts to about two meters from your home or to the nearest drainage swale. You can take your, your um, valuables and toxic materials such as paint Put them in plastic containers and lift them high up on a shelf so that if water gets in they don't get damaged. You can remove any material that's sitting on your floor drain so that if water comes in it can quickly drain away and minimize damage. And you can also get a wide variety of flood alarms to let you know if there's a problem so you can attend to it as quickly as possible. Finally, if you work with your um, government agencies, insurers, and qualified professionals, you can consider things like raising the height of your window wells to four to six inches above the ground. If you have a downspout that's connected into the ground, you can connect, you can um, cut it off, seal where it goes into the foundation drain and extend the downspout to about two meters. You can correct your grading, you can install a backwater valve, and you can also install a backup sump pump and backup battery. Now for situations where um, people tend to have large volumes of water settling around their house if they're near a river or if they're in sort of a depressed area of the neighborhood, they could consider buying some temporary barriers. Those barriers are used before an event happens. Um, you could put a barrier at an opening, so at a window and a door, or around the per perimeter of your property to stop water from coming onto your property. And you also need to be paying attention to the weather and to warnings, for example, from your conservation authority about what's coming up in terms of, of storms or floods so that you can prepare ahead of time because some, uh, some barriers like these pull down barriers of a window and door can take just minutes to pull down but others can take uh, days, for example, putting up thousands of, of sandbags. And we have a great resource that provides different, um, different types of barriers that you can consider getting. Now, the other thing we learned through our research is that people have very limited understanding of insurance and flood insurance in particular. So we like to share those main messages so people can help themselves. So first of all, a lot of people don't know that insurance is only designed to cover sudden and accidental losses. If it can be shown that 
you should have known about uh, a slow leak or a slow, um, a slow predictable problem, then you may not get insurance because it's not meant to cover that. Also, widely available as water damage coverage for flooding leaks from plumbing and appliances is covered in all comprehensive homeowner policies, but there's only limited availability of other types of flood insurance, and it depends on if you if your cons insurance company considers you, you eligible or not. Um, you may purchase additional coverage for sewer backup flooding, underground water and sewer line flooding, or overland flooding, so that's been available since 2015. Some other important tips, because insurance is not meant to cover maintenance, it's important that you complete your seasonal maintenance activities every spring and fall, and if you're going to be away for more than a few days, have a friend or an alarm service monitor your home so that you can keep your insurance coverage. Also, insurance policies are designed only to restore the insured property to its former condition. So, in the event of a flood, what you can do is get one quote to restore the property and one quote to build back better. Something fantastic is you can work with your insurance company for them to pay the basic amount and you pay the difference so that you can have a build back better, more protected basement than you did before. So the other piece is to shop around for insurance coverages because all products and companies are different. Finally, to get additional self-help resources, please visit homefloodprotect.ca. And if you would like to reach out to me for any questions or suggestions, please feel free at c8evans at waterloo.ca. Since I still have 20 seconds, I want to note that we do have a flood risk self-assessment tool that's through that link and you can do a flood risk assessment in five minutes and it'll give you a quick confidential report to get you started. Thank you very much and best of luck everybody. Thank you, Cheryl. That was a great presentation. Lots of really, really helpful information there. So um, just take this opportunity to thank all our presenters this evening. So I did notice we had um, a really good question that came in on the chat. So I just wanted to uh, talk, talk that one through. Um, so the question was around pets. So if there's an emergency and you need to evacuate your home, where are pets welcome? And what do most people do to make sure their pets will stay safe? So I think Janine provided a response on the chat, basically saying there's a number of hotels here in Lindsay, including the Days Inn, Howard Johnson, Victoria Motel and the Nights Inn. And this is a great example of scoping out a place to stay in advance so you can bring your pets with you. So that was a really great question. So thank you for that one. So I, um, I've just been making a few notes here as well. I just had a couple of questions. So just actually, Cheryl, your presentation there. So I think um, the public might be wondering, you know, if I make these changes to my home to make it uh, better for avoiding flooding, is there any funding available from the, the government to help me do that? Or is that something we have to do ourselves? Well, that's a great question. Um, so, Every municipality is different. Um, and as citizens, the great thing is we can influence our municipalities. Um, so for example, I'm not sure what, uh, what the subsidies are that are available in, in your municipality, unfortunately, but I know that municipalities like uh, City of Windsor, um, the um, Burlington, so uh, Halton region, City of Toronto, they provide very generous subsidies to, to support the installation of, um, of backwater valves, sump pumps, backup batteries, alarm systems, etc. Um, so the exciting thing about um, thinking about this is, for example, if your municipality doesn't have those types of subsidies now, you as a resident can bring some information to your council, to your mayor, about what different municipalities are doing to support resident action. 
Um, and ask them to consider it because every year the municipality has to determine different uh, priorities for their budget. So if they're hearing that that's a, a key priority, they might consider it. Um, the other thing that I found really interesting was that um, that the insurance companies are really, they have their ears open to and they're highly competitive. So a lot of insurance companies are now offering uh, discounts for residents who take action. And they're very prescriptive about specific actions that you can take and they'll give you a certain percentage off for this and that. And the other thing about influence is a couple of years ago, for example, my insurance company was not offering, offering any discounts. And so I asked my, uh, my broker about it and he said, oh, I'm really sorry, they're not offering that. And I said, can you please put the formal request to them? I want discounts, I want them now. And he said, okay, I'll put it forward. And then the next cycle, the next year, they offered all the discounts and all the product availability that I'd asked for. So I'm sure it wasn't just me, it was probably other people too, <laughs> but I wanna really impress upon people that you have an opportunity to, to make an influence and make a change uh, with your municipality and with the insurance companies. That's great, thank you very much. That's a really a great answer. And I noticed Janine uh, wanted to come in there as well. So I'm just going to ask Janine to, to come into that question. Uh, yes, because I wanted to let you know that we do have a program called uh, Court the Halliburton Renovate. And applications are actually available right now. And they're available. <laughs> it's great timing. They're <laughs> available until April 30th. So the applications, uh, it's um, a forgivable loan. I'm just actually reading off the website. So if you go to our website, that information's right there. It's a forgivable loan up to a maximum of $10,000. And it includes repairs such as to roofs, plumbing, heating foundations, wells, and septic systems. There can be a grant of, of a maximum of up to $5,000. That's also available for modifications to reduce um, physical barriers for people who might need them for ramps or chairs or bathwits or anything or things like that. You actually apply through our human services department. You can do that online. There is an application itself, so you can contact our office to receive that application, or you can go online to see the application as well. So that was great, great timing. And so we already <laughs> provide it. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Nice. The other thing to note, um, just to, to a shout out to the municipality, that's fantastic. And I've seen many examples of other municipalities that are very excited about these programs. And the tricky thing is if the public does not take them up, they think, oh, they're not necessary. So they tend to wind down the program. So I'd really encourage you to, to look into it and use it so that you don't lose it essentially. That's great. Thank you very much. So I've just noticed uh, we've got another question through the chat. So the question, uh, which may be going to either Irina or Anna, if you've got on the call. So the question was based on the charts showing the water levels and snowpack this year, as things are sitting right now today, what is the best guess in terms of this spring being an uneventful year like last year or a bad year for those on Burnt River? So, yeah, I'd like to tackle this question, if that's okay. That's great. Thanks, Anna. All right. Uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, so in regards to um, what we're looking forward to in terms of fresh, uh, there's still high uncertainty where we're gonna where, what we're going to have in the month of April and May. All we know is very early of fresh science as we are seeing temperatures uh, rising way above the melting uh, triggers uh, uh, at night and during the day and that will definitely trigger the snowpack to start mobilizing itself and we will see increase in lake levels and flows up in Halliburton. This definitely will pick up the inflows in Kawasas and as well as in the rivers. In terms of the forecast and hopefully my slide with the certainty has helped, there's only certainty of two-day forecast. So we know right now we have a high seen across the sections of the watershed right now. If this high moves away, we're definitely subject to any kind of precipitation or amount. So again, subject to high uncertainty in terms of what the forecast is at this point. That's great. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I would like to add just a little bit. Well, Anna is the best expert uh, on the system. However, overall for Southern Ontario, we just received the, the snow park maps from MNRF and there is still significant amount of snow and in the Gull and Burnt uh, River sub watersheds. 
upstream there. Like they are like literally at the average amounts of snow. Should any rain happen, especially like more significant rain with some um, warmer temperature, nothing guaranteed. So yeah, there is a, a big uncertainty at this moment. I wouldn't <laughs> guess and I, I, I wouldn't let our guard down. Okay, thanks, Irina. Really appreciate that. So just um, got some more questions coming in. Um, so one of the questions was, is there one place that people can go to get all the information about who does what? Or is there somewhere we would suggest? Um, so maybe Irina, could you um, take that question? Information about, could you please say again? About water levels? Yeah. Um, just who, do, in terms of the roles and responsibilities, um, you know, do we have information or is the Quad the Lakes have links and information? So I guess if people are looking for any detail around flooding or how to get help, is there one place they can come or are they having to look at different websites? Um, uh, our Coversa Conservation website has a very good information on uh, the water level, on the watershed conditions. Um, we will have uh, links to the uh, um, resources to water levels and precipitations data, not necessarily ours, but other agencies. City of Corsa Lakes, uh, and also we will have the communication on our website. The flood messages is the best place to get uh, flood messages right from the, the Corsa Conservation website. City of Corsa Lakes has an excellent page on flooding, and that is pretty much a um, comprehensive page that includes flood preparedness. It includes uh, um, how to stay informed information, and uh, they do post our messages and messages from the Ministry of Natural Resources as well. And uh, the, the kind of over our overarching site would be uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources slash flood Ontario. They would have, they do have some information um, pretty much covering again, the messages, uh, how to stay prepared and how to get informed, but um, kind of not as good as uh, City of Corsa Lakes and our websites. That's great. Thanks, Irina. And just, um, I guess, following on from that, for those residents that don't live in the city of Carter Lakes, where can they go for help in an emergency? Who would they first turn to? Local municipalities. Local municipalities is your number one resource for assistance. For information, please call us. Like, if you cannot find information on, uh, uh, on the Corsa Conservation website, just call Corsa Conservation. Uh, extension 219 will answer you, will answer your, <laughs> your question, <laughs> or we will find information and call you back to answer your question. Thank yeah. you. So we had uh, a question um, which we get quite a lot around sandbags. So in the city, um, City of Quarter Lakes, where can people go to get information on sandbags or sand and where that's located? Um, I don't know. Janine, if you're able to assist us with that one. Uh, sure I am. I don't, I can't tell you exactly all the locations. I can tell you it's conversations we discuss extensively at almost every flooding meeting or flood preparedness meeting we have, but it, that information is actually on our website and I've sent the link through the chat about the, in, about right. um, to the city's website. So you'll be able to find all that information. They've already been preparing for weeks, getting them all ready to go. And they have them in several locations around city of Kortha Lakes and they tend to put them in areas that are generally more prone to require sandbags. Um, so they're already, and we have, we have volunteers and we have our, our emergency personnel who are all putting them all together to get them all ready. That's amazing, thank you. So I, I had a question um, maybe for Dave. Um, so with your experience of dealing with people who are under stress and in a really 
uh, bad situation, either flooding, is there sort of a common theme of, you know, oh, I wish I'd done this in advance, or is the one thing that, you know, they commonly say, I wish I'd prepared or done something um, if, if I'd known, or do you get any kind of common uh, themes like that when you're dealing with those situations? Muted. <laughs> oh, yes, you're muted, Dave, sorry. Yeah, folks that are experiencing this for the first time, um, always comment after they kind of get calmed down a little bit is, uh, I wish I had have taken some advice and got some things prepared beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things that we experience with people that are under stress, simple little things like they can't even remember their phone numbers, right? Even their own personal phone numbers. So it's quite amazing, right? When you are under that kind of stress, how, uh, how limited uh, sometimes the information that you have um, available to you is. And so in a lot of cases, it would be, I wish I, I wish I would have brought my cell phone with me, or I wish I would have had um, some material that allowed me to better communicate with the, uh, with the community that were affected by it. The other thing we find too, is that once people have experienced this, generally they will get prepared for the next time. <laughs> sure. Right? So my advice to those that are on the phone, on the call here tonight, is that don't wait, right, for something to happen to you. Get prepared now, and then you'll be able to react to it much, uh, much easier. That's great, thank you. Um, so just a question, and again, maybe for this one, maybe. Oh, sorry, Janine, you wanted to come in there. I was just going to say, as Dave said, get prepared. So you do learn. I don't live in a flood prone area, um, but you do learn also what to, extras to put in your emergency kit. I put cards and food, and I do have a list of all the numbers and stuff, but I definitely put that stuff because you could be out of there for a while. So activities to do is all, or books or whatever you might like. It's also a good idea. That's great. Great suggestions. Thank you. And um, so thinking about somebody who has maybe joined the call has never flooded how do I know if I'm actually at risk of flooding so Irene I'll maybe throw this one back to you uh, well, let's say if you live on the river bank or the lecture please check your location <laughs> call your local conservation authority and make sure um just do due diligence and you start with local conservation authority, you start with us, and there will be um, somebody on, the, on uh, the other line of the phone to help you to answer your question, or at least to direct you to the uh, right location. We do have some mapping. We do have floodplain mapping for some uh, rivers and stream, not for all, but we do have uh, some historical, historical knowledge we do have uh, uh, our databases, so we will definitely help with this, with this question. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, and maybe, I guess um, so maybe if I can just add something to that, and it's something that uh, Cheryl actually mentioned in her presentation, right? <laughs> that everybody's home is at risk for some sort of uh, flood damage or water damage to their home, right? And um, you know, I've. In, in my experience in responding to flooding situations um, in communities that are have homes that are on the floodplain and have been impacted by overland flooding, right? Homes that were up on a higher level in a situation where the ground was frozen and the rain didn't have any place to go, there was lots of those in, individuals that had water entering their basement as well um, because the foundation wasn't secure. They weren't taking the water away from their home through their downspouts and the, uh, um, so well away from, uh, from their home. So every, everybody that's on this call, right, is at some sort of risk. And uh, there's some little things that, um, um, that they can do to make sure that they're not impacted. So don't, uh, don't be concerned. Don't, don't just focus. My, my recommendation is just don't focus on, I'm, I'm close to a river, so I'm at risk, right? <laughs> It's going to rain where you are, right? And snow is going to melt where you are. So you're at risk as well. That's great. That's a great point, Dave. Thank you. Cherry, were you wanting to come in there? I'm doing the low tech hand raising. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So I think that's a really important point that, that Dave's making. And I just really want to encourage people to consider doing the home flood protection checkup. Um, you just answer a few yes or no questions. It's all confidential and it will take you through a series of yes or no questions outside your home, inside your home. It'll be th asking things like, uh, do you have you know cardboard boxes on the floor? Do you have paint cans sitting on the floor? And before I started working in the program, I didn't really think about how important it was to, to not think about um, like if it floods, but to, to actually picture uh, when it floods. So you don't say, oh, it won't happen to me. You just start just being really practical and say, okay, so if there is water that ends up uh, say in my basement or my bathtub overflows or I have a leak or something, what is actually gonna get damaged? And you can picture sort of where the water will go and just, it really gives you a, an easy idea of what's gonna get damaged, what doesn't. And the whole idea of having uh, paints or chemicals of some kind on the floor level, um, it was explained to me by a, a, a fire department official that if the water actually gets into there, then say if it's uh, paint or oil, then it, it creates a sheen of on the water and spreads throughout any of the surface of the water. So it, it the cost of, of cleanup is just becomes massive. So that's something I never considered before. Um, but uh, it's, it's important to just um, develop healthy habits too. Like, I mean, Dave and, and the other, uh, reps from Canadian Red Cross are talking about kits and things, but you're going to need to update your kits. Like it's a spring and a fall thing. Just take a look. Do, is my kit still working? Do my numbers need to be updated? It's fall. You know, what do I need to do? Sort of like when you're checking your smoke detectors, you're checking your CO detectors, just go through your maintenance habits um, and do your checkup and see what happens. So um, a, a lot of it for me is just assuming something is gonna happen, just be prepared and also just develop healthy habits, healthy uh, home protection habits. Great. That's great. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, and I think, is it Nina wanted to come in and speak from Canadian Red Cross as well? Go ahead. Hi there. Um, wonderful presentations, by the way. Um, I'm, I know myself, uh, I've learned already a lot and, and I've been in this for, a, um, eight years now. So uh, I've seen my share of flooding uh, situations as well. Uh, one of the things that I just wanted to, um, you know, collaborate a little bit more on was with what Dave had mentioned. You may not seem like you're in a flooding um, area, but remember, everything is always connected to water <laughs> um, in your home. Um, and that is also um, to do with sewage. So you may not be anywhere near the flooding area, however, end up having major sewage problems due to flooding in, you know, the community or the um, area close to you, you know what I mean? So you always have to be prepared um, for different scenarios as well, right? And something that I have learned, um, most companies, uh, most insurance companies won't, um, so if the, the sewage is caused from the actual flooding, it, it's hard to prove that. So you have to be careful um, on, um, on, on what is actually covered in your insurance plans. Um, I know I've had, like I have had issues with uh, beneficiaries uh, calling us up after they um, contacted their insurance company to find out that they don't no longer like they're, they're not going to be covered for the, the damages because it was sewage related um and and they don't classify that as a uh, to do with the flooding even though it is kind of connected in ways so um just being prepared yes most definitely on um different things that you might not would come up might, might not uh, think would come up so uh, and definitely and I agree with when you're when you're the time goes ahead or time goes back or you're you're checking your smoke detectors it's a great time to be able to put uh, you know update those items in the uh, in your kits and sometimes you need to replace them because you know they've gone out of date and things like that so that's a it's a wonderful time to be able to do that and uh, we just kind of finished doing that this uh, last weekend <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> 
That's great. Thank you for that input into there. That's that's really helpful. So I um, we're getting towards the end. So I just had another question, and I think this is maybe one for Cheryl again. So if I was to go out and try and uh, flood proof my home today, is there a list of recommended builders that you might have that could help me or um, anything I should be looking for? Um, we don't provide a list of, of preferred contractors. I think it's just generally a good practice and you can probably see this on a number of government websites in general, sort of like, um, um, what would you call it, consumer affairs types of websites. Um, it's just really good practice to check to see if the uh, contractor has uh, insurance. If you can get, say, three good references from people. And it's also good to get uh, two to three different quotes from people, um, just to make sure that you're, you're shopping around and doing your due diligence. Uh, those are the main principles, but we, we can't recommend any one, uh, one contractor or service provider. It's not we're, what we're able to do at the University of Waterloo. Thank you. That's useful to know. Okay. Um, I think we're, we're, we're drawing to a close. So are there any, I would invite any of the presenters if there's any final comments or thoughts before we close the call for the evening. Cheryl. Put my low tech hand again. Sorry, I, I'm not going to bother <laughs> trying to push the button. I'll probably mess something up. But it, it just really reminds me of when uh, we did home flood protection assessments in New Hamburg. And we did them with folks that were right along the river. And uh, we were talking to people about what was it. This is after a, a spring flood, actually, a, about a month after. And we talked to about five different people. And nobody had a backflow preventer in their home, but us like a, a you know, the box with a flap that, that automatically protects you. What we found fascinating was that people who understood how the, the river level can sometimes, um, the river water can sometimes get into the drainage system, the storm, the, sorry, the sewer system, like even through the manhole covers, you know, the river can drain in through there and sort of fill up the sewers. The people that understood that, they knew there was a flood warning. So all that they did was they stopped using, making more sewage. They stopped flushing their toilets. They stopped having a shower. And that way they didn't add any more sewage to the already full system. But the people that thought, oh, well, the system's fine. It's fine. They had a shower, they did the dishes. Those people had sewer backups because the system was already full. So if you want to go low tech initially and not bother with a, a backflow preventer right away until you do more research, if you do hear there's a flood warning and water, the water levels are very high, make sure to stop producing sewage so that you don't flood yourself. It's really low tech and of those, those people, um, the, three, the three people knew about that simple tip and didn't get flooded, the other two people didn't know and they flooded themselves with sewage water. Ugh. Wow, that's a great tip. And I think one I'll be taking away myself. <laughs> yeah. I was just about to say, I learned so much from our session. It's so great. Thank you everybody for great presentations. Yeah, You're very welcome. Thank you. So um, I just invite Dave or Janine um, or Anna, I know he's on the phone. Any final comments before we close tonight? Um, I just like to say again uh, to, uh, to compliment you on taking this initiative, right? I think that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a move in the right direction to uh, help people understand that uh, being prepared makes a difference. And um, and I, uh, I I thank you thank you for the opportunity to uh, to participate um, in this evening's uh, program. And that's that's right. I, thank you. That, that's what I was going to say. Thank you so much for inviting us to participate and including. It's great to have all the different groups together. And then, how will we get the information, the recording? How will we have access to that if we were to share that? 
So we will be um, sending out a link, a YouTube link to everybody that's participated and obviously all of you as presenters as well. So that will be available and it will also be on our website. Um, so people can access it that way, that way and watch us again. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Great. I know Anna's on the phone. Anna, was there anything um, you wanted to say? Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I'd like to definitely thank your team for organizing this presentation um, um, opportunity and on behalf of Parks Canada and always looking forward to uh, provide this update on an annual basis to, uh, to uh, the users of the system and stakeholders. Thank you. That's great. And I have to thank Irina as well for pulling all of this together. She's done a fantastic job. So thank you, Irina. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, I will um, end our uh, seminar this evening and just thank all the presenters and everybody for joining. Uh, we've really enjoyed having you all here today um, and I'm gonna stop the recording shortly and enjoy the rest of your evening. So thank you very much. Good thank night, everybody. everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.